And whether it's my situation or any other situation where people have died in Scientology, that's how they view human life. Human life can be taken, it can be destroyed, as long as the agenda for Scientology remains intact. If it benefits Scientology, it doesn't matter whether I kill myself or I kill somebody else. It helps Scientology. And because Scientology's purpose is to clear this planet, then they're willing to do anything necessary, even to the point of killing somebody to make it happen. And uh, it, to me, at that time, I remember how troubled that I was and how upset that I was and how much I wanted to get back to Portland, to my home. And even then, I was thinking, I need to get out of this situation. I need to remove myself from this situation. And then later on, it was brought to my attention that, well, it's not just Cynthia we need to get rid of, it's also Fort Green, the attorney. And uh, I remember flying on the plane back to Portland and spending a lot of time on that plane crying, thinking, how did I get myself in this situation? Why do people that I looked upon as family, as people that I trusted and loved, why all of a sudden are they telling me now that I used to do something so criminal and so hurtful towards someone else? And then even telling me it's okay just to kill myself for that. I mean, what value did I have to them? So there's a lot of conflicting emotions going through my mind. At the same time, though, I wanted to be a hero to them. I wanted to impress them. I wanted them to, to love me and to think of me as part of their family core. And so, like I said, I was conflicted because while I was hurt over the fact that they were telling me to kill someone, I also wanted to kill her because they told me that it was necessary to do that. But that's not how it turned out. And how it went on? You went to Chicago or? No, I didn't go to Chicago. I stayed in Portland. And the next day after that I spoke to a priest in Portland and it was a friend of mine who's a Catholic priest and I told him what had happened and he's and I don't know whether he really fully believed me because you know people when they think church stuff like this doesn't happen in the church and so I thought about it and I just stayed very quiet about it I said nothing it was a couple of months later and this is after days and weeks of being harassed by Scientologists to contact the Los Angeles branch. People were going to talk to me and I, and I told them I was sick, I needed time off, I was depressed. And I kept avoiding them that finally the pressure got so intense that I needed to fly back to Los Angeles. Uh, that I contacted the Cultural Awareness Network. And I just had a very short conversation with Sue Kissler, who at that time was very afraid of me. And I said, just have one of your lawyers contact me, it's very important. And she asked me, why is it important? And I said, because they put a contract out on your life. Have one of your lawyers contact me. And it was just a couple hours after that that I got a very, very angry phone call from one of her lawyers. And he, the first thing he said is, my name is Dan Leipold. You are a Scientologist, and I don't trust you. I don't like you. I just want you to know that. But I'm willing to hear what you have to say. And I said, well, one, I don't give a shit whether you like me or not. I don't care whether you trust me or not. But if you don't talk to me, your client might end up dead. And from that point on, we met. He flew to Portland, and I spoke to him. What... I also provided Dan Leipold was an addition to the threats when I decided to leave Scientology and to address my concerns to this attorney from the Cultural Awareness Network. I, over a period of two to three days, walked out of the Scientology office that I was working in with boxes and boxes of documents that showed their participation in criminal and unethical activities copies of photographs, canceled checks, stuff that showed their involvement in criminal activity. And in my meeting with the Cultural Awareness Network attorney, I put that out all on record. 
and it was the basis of the stuff that I submitted into the court record that caused so much commotion, not only in this deposition, which had to be canceled because Scientology attorneys disrupted it. You and Eugene Ingram jumped up and threatened to assault the attorney. A federal judge ordered it to be continued in the courthouse to make sure that Scientology is disrupted. And then that led to another deposition in the Fishman Geertz case, which lasted 17 days. And it was 17 days over a 60-day period because Scientology went to such extremes to threaten me, to threaten me bodily harm, um, to disrupt the hearings and so on. So, I mean, it just grew from that point. And uh, why did the police or the district attorney not uh, started to investigate against uh, the Office of Special Affairs, Kurt Weiland or even David Miscavige regarding that order to kill somebody? Because that's usual normally if no, it comes no, out not court. In, not in the United States. In the United States you have to understand we're a democracy. Everyone has rights. It's your word against my word. And I was told by the district attorney's office in Los Angeles, well, you can say it, and they will say they didn't say it, so where's the evidence? We can't investigate unless there's evidence. And I remember talking to this deputy district attorney, and I, and I told this person, I said, so what you're telling me is we need to kill Cynthia Kisser first before you'll investigate, is that correct? And she said, basically, that's true. Something has to happen physically before we can investigate. That's the way it is here in America. Your word against my word. Unless there's something... If it was even brought up to me, Mr. Scarf, when all this was happening, how come you didn't think of taking a tape recorder and taping it? I said, I'm a Scientologist. You don't go in and tape your bosses. You don't do that. You know... Law enforcement here in this country think very differently than, than other places. And it's just that here in America, uh, because the court system is so broad and the laws here can be interpreted in so many different ways, that the police in the United States are not going to investigate unless there's some kind of physical evidence that they can take to the court and they can use to prove some kind of criminal activity has happened. Oh, written orders or something like that. Written this. orders, that's mm -hmm. correct. But and they never do written orders for that. Scientology kind of didn't give me any written orders. They said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put you on a plane. I even gave them, uh, I told the district attorney that I had gone to Chicago at one point to do some activities with the, cult, with the uh, OSA people in Chicago. I gave her a copy of the plane ticket. So what? It's just a plane ticket. Big deal. Mm. So There's no physical thing. evidence. Um, you know, I, I it, from what I was told by the police officials here in the United States, I should have gone to Chicago, I should have cut her brake lines, I should have run her off the road and tried to kill her. Then, they could have done something. But because simply someone told me to kill her, and it would have been my word against a very powerful organization of Scientology lawyers and officials, my word meant nothing. That's the way it works in this country. And, I mean, we are always referring to one case in this country, and that's the O.J. Simpson case. How a black celebrity can murder his wife and an innocent individual and get away with it. Because that's the way things work in this country. It's your word against ours, and it's how you can convince people otherwise. And certainly Scientology attorneys have always said, we never met with him, we never said anything to him, he's never been a Scientologist, despite the fact that I've got evidence to prove it. But they don't even talk about that. They don't talk about the canceled checks, they don't talk about the money that was paid to me, they just ignore that. I didn't get her. Okay, don't leave it. Finish, finish, finish. finish.
hey, by the way, when is um, that uh, picket going to be in Germany? Which one? The, the big one that Scientologists are doing. I'm like, come on. Are you filming me? Yeah. Oh my God, you're like a Scientologist. How much fun do you want? Hi, is this Mike Render? This is his spot, Gary Scarf, and I'm Peter Reichels here. Do you want to talk with me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, would you just put the camera down? I posted last night that we played around the Celebrity Center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed this morning it was gone. I wonder if they canceled it. You're on the cancel list? I've canceled some of my other posts. Scientology loves to cancel posts. Uh. Stupid American computer. Please work for me. I'm, I'm thinking about getting Earthlink. You know? of my post. Okay, I'm off. I'll have to repost it. So now it's recording. Hi, Ina. <laughs> I uh, miss you. So, uh, <laughs> so I think we talk um, we talk a little bit um, about your history. Where uh, we have to. Where we have. Everybody yeah. knows my history. Yeah, no, not everybody. Not the German television. They don't know. Not Egmont Koch has it. Not everything. I'm the typer. Just push this. Yeah, that, like that. So. Um, for your private things, where you have been born and when and... I was born in Fort Madison, Iowa, which is in the Midwestern part of the United States. And I grew up mostly in Florida. And my father started to work for the space program at the Kennedy Space Center. And after I graduated from high school... Do we need to stop because of the noise? Yeah, it's too loud. It's too loud. Reach over and you can shut that window. Just pull it down. Oof. Now it's better with the sound out. Uh, ah, it works. Okay, it's fine. Mm hmm. I have to. That's great. So we start again. It's okay. So, where you have been born? I was born in Iowa, which is in the Midwestern part of the United States, and lived most of my life in Florida up until high school, and then from Florida I moved to Portland, Oregon. 16 years in Portland, Oregon, I moved to Florida, where I spent five years, and now I'm in Los Angeles, where I used to work at the time that I was living in Portland, uh, work for Scientology, both in Portland and Los Angeles, mm -hmm. but I live primarily in Portland, Oregon. And what was your education? Did you study? Yes, I have a college degree, a bachelor's degree in criminology in Portland, Oregon, and a master's degree in public administration from the same university. And when did your history with uh, the Scientology organization started? How did you came in? Uh, informally back in 1978, where I was doing some volunteer stuff for Scientology, but I wasn't that involved because I was more involved in my college education. But in 1982 is when I signed a staff contract with the Mission of Davis and became more involved in Scientology and started uh, a history that I very much regret. What have been your uh, first jobs 
uh, within the organization? Uh, I was working with the register and recruiting people into the organization. That was when I passing out flyers, talking to people about Scientology, encouraging them to take what they still do as the personality test. Uh, that went into raising money for the church uh, because I was a financial aid recipient receiving government funds to go to school. I learned how you could uh, play around with the documents and Scientology already had a history of documents doctoring uh, statements and uh, getting monies illegally and I learned how to do that myself. So I was actually teaching Scientologists how they can apply for government loans and grants deceptively and once they receive that money they turn it over to Scientology. They never went to school, but the money simply went to Scientology. Mm -hmm. And so I became involved in that with them. Um, also, Scientology doesn't like the fact that critics are publishing books and magazine articles about them and they make every attempt to stop it. And if, in fact, articles and books are published, they will send Scientologists into the libraries, into the bookstores, wherever there's magazines that are critical of them, and they will tear the pages of the magazines when they register the books. And so I would go into the libraries. Having worked part-time while in college in a library, I learned how they put the security strips on books so a person can't walk out of the library without sending off an alarm. And I learned how they did that. So I also taught other Scientologists where to look for the metal strips that they put into the books. So you could walk into a library, remove the metal strip, and walk out of the book, out of the library with a book. And uh, the library would not have any books for called Scientology. In fact, when I left Scientology, I wrote a letter to the library book system in Portland, Oregon, informing them about this operation where Scientologists walk into the libraries and they remove books that are called Scientology. And the head librarian wrote me a letter saying, in fact, it was like 24 books in the library critical of Scientology were no longer there, that they just disappeared. And I said, well, that's because Scientology destroys the such materials. So the public only sees L. Ron Hubbard books and books on Scientology to promote Scientology. Anything critical is immediately removed and destroyed. And who gave this order to... This to comes down from the Office of Special Affairs, which used to be the Guardian's office, but because the Guardian's office was in a lot of turmoil back in the 70s when 11 of the top executives within the Guardian's office were arrested, convicted, and thrown in prison for committing felonies, it was a bad public relations move for Scientology, so they changed the name of the office, but they didn't actually change the office itself. So the activities continued, but the name changed to the Office of Special Affairs to give it a nice sounding name. And it came directly from the Office of Special Affairs headquarters in Los Angeles. And who was the head at your time when you started there in Madison? Well, the head, of, the head at that time was Mike Rinder, although I didn't have a lot of contact with Mike Rinder. My terminal was David Butterworth, who was head of OSA for the Western section of the United States. And David answered directly to Mike Rinder, but all of my orders came from David Butterworth. And it means that Mike Rinder is now the boss for over 20 years? Yes. For the Office of Special Affairs, for the Secret Service? Al he's always been in charge of the Office of Special Affairs. There has been a lot of questions about the executives in the church moving around, assuming different positions. Certainly in public interviews, when they've uh, talked to some of the else in special affairs, they have made references to Kurt Weiland and to Norm Starkey and to other people in the church, but Mike Rigger has really been the director. Anything that is done throughout the world dealing with any type of intelligence activity, illegal activity on behalf of the Church of Scientology always has to have the approval of Mike Rinder. Nothing goes without Mike Rinder's approval. If in fact someone commits an illegal act for Scientology and Mike Rinder hasn't approved it, that person you don't see anymore. That person is removed from his post, he's using RPF, he's sent to Happy Valley, and he's punished because Mike Rinder is the sole individual who has to put his stamp of approval on every action that takes place throughout the world any type of intelligence activity. It's a big job for him, but he enjoys doing it. So. Mm -hmm. And uh, does his uh, his boss is uh, right now David Miscavige? That's correct. And uh, is he giving me the orders? 
Or is he, or is, or is Miscavige knowing what Render is doing? Is he informed? At Misca the step? Not, he's not informed of everything that Render does, but he pretty much trusts Mike Render. Because Mike Render, you have to understand, grew up in Scientology. His second generation Scientologist, meaning that he grew up in Scientologist as a kid. He really knows nothing else outside of Scientology because he grew up in the church. He was born and grew up in the church. And there's enough trust in Mike Render that Miscavige doesn't have to put his, his stamp of approval on everything that Mike Render does because he trusts him. And uh, that's just the way it is with Mike Render. Hmm. People he is trusted by David Miscavige. So you worked from the beginning on for the Office of Special Affairs for the yes. Secret Service? Um, off and on, I wasn't that involved with OSA. I did some things that came under the tutelage of the Office of Special Affairs, but I wasn't that intimately involved with them until 1990 and 91 when they decided they wanted to destroy the Cult Awareness Network. What is the Cult of Awareness Network? The Cult, Net was, the cult, in, the cult Awareness Network is uh, a national organization, very legitimate organization that reached out to families and people that were affected by religious cult organizations. They were also a national clearinghouse information for churches, schools, community centers, for law enforcement people wanting to know more about cults. And well, how, important, how important was that organization? It was an extremely important organization. It was really the only legitimate organization that one could call to get legitimate information on a religious organization or cult organization. And because the Cult Awareness Network saw Scientology as one of the most terroristic, aggressive, intimidating cults, Scientology decided to pour all their money and aggressive efforts into destroying the Cult Awareness Network uh, by bankrupting it financially, by suing it. They, had, they filed well over 35 to 40 lawsuits against the organization, to tie it up in court, to force it to pay attorney's fees and court costs, and to bankrupt it. And also to attack members of the organization. For example, they ordered me to go and murder two of the top members of the Cultural Awareness Network, one being the national director, and the other one being an attorney who had brought litigation against Scientology that was a member of the Cultural Awareness Network. Now, they, now, suggestions have been made by Scientologists that, one, while well, we were just testing his faith to see if he would really do it, to see how faithful he was with Scientology. The other suggestion has been made, well, we were just joking. We would never tell anyone to do that. Scientology does not joke, particularly within OSA. They don't joke around. When they tell you to do something, you do it. And if you don't do it, then you're thrown off your post and you're punished. They don't joke like that in Scientology. And how, how uh, dangerous do you think is uh, the, uh, the Office of Special Affairs under Mike Render? It's a very, very dangerous organization. Scientology is the most horrendous, terroristic, cult, criminal organization that exists today, primarily because it puts so much money into its public relations efforts. It uses its celebrity members to promote this wonderful church that it is. They have no problem with deceiving, misrepresentation, or lying about what they're up to. They have very strong belief in acceptable truth. Uh, acceptable truth meaning that if I convince you, if I'm lying to you, but I convince you that I'm telling you the truth, then that is acceptable truth and it's okay. Which is why they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars lobbying our congressmen, our senators, of uh, pulling the wool, so to speak, over the eyes of Madeleine Albright and our, uh, see, you know, our service, our U.S. Foreign Service Department. Because right now, Madeleine Albright has made statements condemning Germany for the persecution of Scientology. Well, Madeleine Albright is an idiot because there's enough history out there to show what Scientology is up to and what they're trying to do in Germany, here in America, and otherwise. And Madeleine Albright has simply put up her hand and said, I don't want to see it. I'm going to do things the way that I want to do it. And either she is incredibly stupid or she has been paid off by Scientology. It's got to be one or the other. And is there a direct inf influence from the Office of Special Affairs headquarters here in Los Angeles uh, for, for, Germany, for, for German critics, for German government people who are against Scientology or try to, um, try to inform the, uh, the public about the real background of Scientology? I don't uh, understand your question. Um, 
how do they get the order? Um, are there the same things going on in, in, in Germany against critics organized from here uh, than here in the United States? Is it the same uh, quality? You have to understand that anything that happens throughout the world with the Office of Special Affairs always comes out of Los Angeles and from Mike Rinder. In fact, when I was in Germany last February and I picketed the Munich Org of Scientology, I was informed when I came back here to America that within 10 minutes, Kurt Weiland, who was one of the top executives of Scientology International, was informed that I was in Munich picketing the org there. 10 minutes mm. that he found out that I was picketing the org. Anything that happens in Europe, Asia, the Mideast involving Scientology, anything involving OSA has to come through the international branch here in Los Angeles. And Mike Rinder becomes aware of it, or Kurt Weiland, that Mike Rinder is not available. Kurt Weiland will uh, either approve or disapprove of a certain action. So anything that might have happened to me, although I was not assaulted in any way in Germany, had I been assaulted by a Scientologist in Germany, that would have had to have had the approval of some here in Los Angeles. And they didn't approve it. And how far are they going uh, with their... Um with their, with their um, yeah, spy work against critics. How far is, is uh, Mike Render going with his orders? They have no... To, to everything or...? You have to understand in Scientology, everything is based upon a win. Scientology has to win no matter what costs. Scientology likes to play games with words. They have policies that are very specific that they have to follow. These policies were written long ago by L. Ron Hubbard, the founder the Messiah of Scientology. Anything that L. Ron Hubbard writes cannot be changed. It can be amended to make it sound better to the public, but it cannot be changed. Back in 1967, L. Ron Hubbard developed a policy called the Fair Game Policy, which said when it comes to critics or suppressive people, suppressive persons, they can be tricked, lied to, sued, or destroyed without any punishment to the Scientologist that seeks to destroy or hurt a critic of Scientology. Now, because that made such a bad public relations move for Scientology and the media, they said, well, we came out with a policy canceling that policy. Well, in Scientology, you cannot cancel policies. You can simply change the wording so it doesn't sound as bad. So they came out with an order saying that we will no longer use the fair game words. However, the way we treat critics has not changed. That came out in the second order, which shows that the fair game policy, even though it's not being called fair game, is still in effect, and they're still pulling the same crap, the same criminal activity that they've done for 20 years. So when they have said, we're going to go after Gary Scarf, we're going to go after every critic of Scientology, we're going to trick them, we're going to sue them, we're going to destroy them, they mean it, and they're going to continue to follow that until it happens. And um, as you know, it could also go as far as uh, try to kill them. Yes, definitely. They have claimed that I am this psychological, pathological liar, which, by the way, is not unusual because any critic, that any person that leaves Scientology, who is an ex-Scientologist, that shows the courage to speak up against them is always labeled a liar is always labeled a pathological individual, a sick individual. That's just common. They use that toward any critic of Scientology. In fact, Mike Rinder has said on, in open interviews to a national audience, in his opinion, and understand that he is a top executive in Scientology that is the one rubber stamping criminal actions throughout the world on behalf of Scientology, Mike Rinder has said, Every person that criticizes us is a criminal, and he has to have some kind of criminal activity in his background. We are going to find it, and we're going to expose it. What Mike Rinder does not tell you is, if we can't find that criminal activity, we're going to make it up, and we're going to create it for you and put it out there, which is why innocent people have been slandered and have been hurt by being accused of being child molesters of abusive people, of committing criminal acts which they didn't commit. Scientology loves to do this. And unfortunately, because Scientology is based in Los Angeles, in the United States, 
it makes perfect sense for them because here in America you can get away with so many things that you can't get away with in Europe because we're a democracy here. Democracy. And democracy means different things to different people. To Scientology it means we can continue to break the laws, to challenge the laws, and do all these wonderful, dirty things to people and get away with it. And so far, they've pretty much gone unchallenged. After all, they've gotten Madeleine Albright to speak in their behalf. They've gotten President Clinton to speak on their behalf because President Clinton likes celebrities. So what do they do? They send John Travolta to Washington, D.C. to be nice to President Clinton. And all of a sudden, President Clinton is not willing to hear about all of the people that have been hurt, that have been threatened, that have had their lives destroyed by Scientology. The only thing that our president cares about is John Travolta is in the White House. And we love John Travolta. He's a great actor. So here in America, people are easily fooled by a lot of what comes out of public relations. And Scientology, like I said, will spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to promote that agenda because it works here in America. What they're finding is that it doesn't work in Germany. It's interesting because here in America we look at Europeans as not being as smart as we are. We have this attitude that the Europeans always have to depend on Americans. And so it's just very interesting that here in America so many people have been hurt and they continue to be hurt by this major criminal cult organization Yet in Europe, the people that we see as inferior to Americans are the ones that are actually taking action against Scientology, which has really thrown Scientology upside down because now they're trying to figure out how are we going to do the same things to Germany that we've done in America. And they're finding that very difficult because the German officials are not fooled by what Scientology is perpetuating. And it's too bad that we cannot learn that example here in America. Mm -hmm. um, so it started with the library, with the small things with the library, what you've done inside there for Scientology and uh, for the Office of Special Affairs. What kind of other jobs, uh, or how did they choose you for, for these uh, special jobs? Who chose you and, and why? why the you? person that I worked with initially was Gwen Mayfield, who was the director of Office of Special Affairs in Portland, Oregon, where I was living. She was in charge of OSA. She answered directly to David Butterworth. And the, I can't, I don't know specifically why they chose me, but I think it was because of commitment. I was dedicated to help them. I was in such a mental state that I wanted to be accepted by them. I was going through a lot of family problems, a lot of personal problems, and they became pretty much my family. And I wanted to impress them. And when they told me to do something, I did it without question. And what did they and promise that's what you? They wanted. And what did they promise you for that? They promised me that I would always be accepted, I would be part of the family, I could always go to them if I had a problem. If I was without a job, they would find me a job. Like, you know, the affection was there. And uh, plus, in Scientology, you feel empowered. You feel that you can take on the world and overcome it. You can overcome any problem within Scientology. And that was constantly fed to me, stay with us and we can help you do that. However, in Scientology, there's always a price you pay for something. You don't get anything for free in Scientology. If they offer you something, it always comes with a tag, and that tag says you're going to have to do something for us in order for us to do something for you. And it usually meant doing something illegal, but Scientology kind of joked. They always had a phrase that they used in Scientology, and they joked about it. They said nothing is illegal unless you're caught, and they kind of joked about it all the time. So if I go out and kill someone and I get away with it, it's not illegal because I've not been caught. Mm -hmm. And who uh, developed the plans against the critics again, or to raise money or to get money in a special way or, or this, um, uh, this order to, to kill critics, for example? Who, um, who developed the plans? How high it comes to the plan from, from, from my window? No, it's, no, all the Scientologists are pretty much taught from day one how are we going to benefit the Church of Scientology? So as far as like the minor plans on how we can get money from people, how we can deceive people, the lower level Scientologists are taught to do that from day one. And when you're a Scientologist, it's, it's very hard to explain, but you're not specifically, I mean, I was working for OSA 
And when people knew me in Scientology, they knew that I was working for OSA. And there were some people that were very much afraid to be around me because there was a certain power that went with being a member of OSA. Uh, and uh, to give you an example, there was a person in Portland that I asked to do something, and she said no, and I reported her. She was RPF. To the prison uh, camp or to the working camp. Exactly, because she didn't do what I told her to do. Uh, there, were, there was uh, other people there that knew that if they pissed me off, and I complained, they would be RPF. So they were afraid of me. In that fact, I worked for OSA. But also, in addition to the specific duties that you have in Scientology, pretty much any Scientologist that is asked to do something that's going to help the church, could be unethical, could be illegal, would come under the framework of OSA. And they would be assisting OSA, although they were not specifically working for OSA. So every Scientologist had their foot basically in the door of OSA, although they didn't work for them. So we would sit down, Gwen Mayfield, Angie Mann, who is another OSA operative up in, in Portland, Oregon, I would sit around and we would develop ideas. What can we do you know, to further destroy the credibility of people within the Cult Awareness Network? How can we bring money to the organization? And one of the things that I did is because I had gain the trust of members in the Cult Awareness Network. I told her, why don't I just join the Cult Awareness Network and I will pass every bit of information that I get onto Scientology. And they agreed. And so I went and I met with a couple that was very involved in the Cult Awareness Network and I became very close to them to the point that they were referring to me as their second son. They did not know that I was reporting everything back to Scientology. That they did not know that when I assisted them with fundraising efforts, when they trusted me to be in charge of the money, that the money was disappearing. And when I said, you know, a car was burglarized, or I had been robbed, what had actually happened is I made it look like a robbery or a burglary, and the money was sent to Scientology. And Scientology accepted that with glee. They thought it was the funniest thing in the world, while the people that lost the money were in deep pain and were hurt. In fact, it's been almost eight years now since I have not been involved in Scientology, and some of those people that I hurt continue to hate me and have no respect for me whatsoever because I cause so much hurt and so much pain. And there are people today that talk to the media about Scientology that refer to Gary Scarf in the worst possible terms because I hurt them so badly when I was in Scientology. That's how deep it gets when it comes to Scientology. And Scientology looks at it and they laugh. They think it's funny. When people die, they laugh. They, they, they think it's funny. When Lisa McPherson died in clean water, they kind of laugh at that and they say, so what? She wanted to leave Scientology. She was no one value to us anymore. So what? She died. Ha ha ha. Let's move on. What kind of? What does that tell you about people in Scientology? It's not a healthy organization by any means. And how this went on with uh, your jobs for OSA? How they developed after that? Um, after they saw that I was taking responsibility and following through on things that I had committed myself to doing, and they saw that they could trust me. I went on to doing other things, uh, certain things that I'm not at liberty to talk about, that which I have an attorney representing me for, because things that I could still go to prison for if they came out into the light. Uh, it's also presented a very interesting relationship with Scientology that I have now, because Scientology executives know that they could come out and they could expose me to certain prosecutions with the federal government for crimes committed years ago. But they also know that if they do that, I'm gonna turn them in. And so if Gary Scarf goes to prison, so will some Scientology executives. For example? Huh? For example? I'm not gonna go into the specific incidences, but uh, they know that there's certain things that I have over their heads and they also have it over my head, so it's kind of like a detente situation. 
if they come after me on certain situations that are going to get me into trouble with the authorities, I'm going to turn it on them, and they're going to go and face the same troubles that I face with the authorities. So uh, I'm not going to even talk about it. I've been in numerous depositions in, in the courts where I have been told and even ordered to talk about them, and I have absolutely refused to talk about it because in my personal opinion, I feel that I was brainwashed when I was in Scientology, that I was acting on the orders of Scientology to impress Scientology. My whole world was to impress Scientology, and that's why I did it. And I'm not willing to go to prison for something that I did for this criminal court organization. I understand that. And how uh, worked this Ken case going on? Who developed the plan to, at the end, to for this uh, order to murder? That initially, to? initially, that they created what they call Plan 100, and the idea was for the Church of Scientology International to fund individual lawsuits in the name of individual members, because as an organization or as an entity here in America, an organization cannot file 100 lawsuits against another organization. However, individual members of Scientology can do that. So what they did is they chose 100 of their most trusted members and they funded lawsuits against the Cold Awareness Network. Now that was the plan. The plan was 100 lawsuits against the Cold Awareness Network and to continue 100 lawsuits. So if one or two were dismissed, two more would pop up, and they would keep 100 lawsuits going at any one time to bankrupt CAN. They never got to the 100 lawsuits. They did get up to, I believe, 29 lawsuits, and they found that that in itself was very costly just to fund 29 lawsuits. But they did sue them 29 times, not only the Cultural Awareness Network, but Cynthia Kisser as an individual, who was Cynthia Kisser? Cynthia Kisser is the executive director of the Cult Awareness Network who was coming out on national television speaking out against Scientology on numerous occasions. That means it, she was the main enemy for Scientology That's in the correct. United States? That's correct. For years? And so they sued her individually in addition to suing the organization, but because she worked for the Cult Awareness Network, the Cult Awareness ne Network was basically responsible for her. So the Cult Awareness Network ended up having to pay her legal fees as well. Well, the Church of Scientology was still upset with the fact that here in America, our courts work very, very slowly. And even though they were suing the Cult Awareness Network and it was going through the motions, it dragged on and on and on. And here in America, a court case can go 10 to 12 years before anything is settled. This really upset David Miscavige. This upset the attorneys for Scientology that they wanted to do something quickly that would really send a, a, a response to the Cultural Awareness Network that it's time to close the shop. So an a meeting was held with Scientology attorneys in Los Angeles. I was invited to the meeting by Eugene Ingram. I went to the meeting not knowing what was going on because I had met with Scientology attorneys before because they had planned for me to be one of the 100 lawsuits. In fact, they had actually drafted a lawsuit with my name on it to sue the Cult Awareness Network. And while that was still being looked at and the, tr and the, the lawsuit written up, we had this meeting and it was shared with me that it was time a more immediate response to the Cult Awareness Network. And the way to really knock down the Cult Awareness Network was to go after the person that was really holding the Cult Awareness Network up. If we could get her out of the picture altogether, the Cult Awareness Network would collapse because she was really the glue that was holding the organization together. So it was decided, and it did not come out, let's, let's kill her, let's just kill her. Who's that that? Rick Moxon, who is one of the top in-house attorneys for the Church of Scientology, said, what if we just cut her brake lines? If we cut her brake lines on her Ford Bronco, she'll lose control of the vehicle, and she'll hit a tree, or she'll run off the road, and she will die. And people are kind of joking about how we can get rid of her. And it was also commented, well, 
just because you lose control of the vehicle and you run off the road and crash doesn't mean you're going to die. So it was also talked about, well, why doesn't Gary have a pillow with him? He'll follow the car. Cut the brake lines. If she stays on the road, take the car, knock her off the road. Check her out afterwards, after she crashes, if she's still alive, stick a pillow over her face. Or drag her out of the car and stick her into the water and drown her. I mean, people were joking about the different ways you can kill a person. But it was decided that we need to take care of Cynthia Kisser and get her out of the picture. And you know, which office did this happen? This in? happened in the office of Bowles and Moxon, which is now called um, Moxon and Bartleson. This is within but the Office of Special Affairs. This was actually in the headquarters of the Church of Scientology here in Los Angeles. But because so many negative criminal things have been pointed and focused on this office in the offices in the Church of Scientology, they got smart and they moved that office out of the Church of Scientology and they put it in a distant city in the LA area called Glendale. Mm -hmm. They moved it so to another would, location so, so it would draw away from the fact that it was part of Scientology. So you get the order in Glendale? No, no, no. I got the order here at the Church of Scientology International. But it was after I testified on court record about the murder conspiracies and the plans to kill Cynthia Kisser and also to kill Ford Green. And other people started testing the fact that there were unexplained deaths in the past. And all of this stuff started to come up about Scientology's conspiracies and criminal activities. Scientology got upset and decided, well, people are looking at this law office and the law office is sitting right in the core of Scientology. And people are going to think, well, it must be true because it's sitting right in the Scientology building. So they thought by moving the law office out of the Scientology building and making it a separate office somewhere else, that people would not draw a connection between the law office and the Church of Scientology. And even today, Rick Moxon says, I'm a Scientologist, but I only work for Scientology. I am not doing what Scientology is telling me to do, but he's which, is, which is a true. total lie. It's a total fabrication. He's a high OSA official. He is a high OSA official. Lori Bartleson was a high uh, official of Scientology. And in fact, I don't think it's uh, Moxon Bartleson anymore. I think it's now Moxon and Coburn. Mm -hmm. Helena Coburn has stepped in. So it's like the third change that has taken place in Scientology since I left. And how is uh, Mike Grinder's or Kurt Weiland's involvement in that murder order? for you. Is he involved in that thing or did she know? Did I she don't know, know what if doing? Mike Rinder himself was aware but after the meeting was over I had some real problems particularly when they're telling me all we want you to do because you have to understand the frame of mind that I was in is that I felt very blessed one that they would bring me into a meeting with all of the Scientology attorneys. But the fact that all they said is, Gary, we want you to fly to Chicago. We will fly to Chicago. We will teach you how to cut the brake lines on an automobile. And all you have to do is cut them and follow her. And if she gets, if she's still alive, all you have to do is put a pillow over her face and smother her. No big deal. And what they're asking me to do was to kill a person which is the most serious thing you can do to somebody, but they were saying, oh, it's very easy. Follow them and put a pillow over their head until they stop breathing. It's no big deal. Like that, what you, how That's you talking how about? That's how they presented it to me. And if you do that, you will be a hero in Scientology. And then I was telling my friend, who I thought was my friend at the time, Eugene Ingram, I have some problems with this. We need to talk. Because at that time, I pretty much saw Eugene Ingram as a father figure, someone that I could talk to. Because even though Eugene Ingram is the top security official for Scientology, he is not a Scientologist himself. And so there were some things that Eugene and I could talk about that he did not agree with, with Scientology officials on and we would talk about. But at the same time, there was someone that I could talk to. And I said, Eugene, I don't know. We need to talk. But well, as I was exiting Rick Moxon's office, David Miscavige was in the hallway walking towards me with two of his aides. 
And I said, hello, Mr. Miscavige. And he looked right at me and says, hello, Mr. Scarf, how are you? And I walked up to him and I hugged him. And he hugged me back, which is very unusual because in Scientology, they don't hug officials. And in fact, when I've told other ex-Scientologists that I hugged David Miscavige, they were surprised that I was going to RPF on the spot because you don't get that close to an official of Scientology, particularly the commander of Scientology. But I did. And I said, I just came out of a meeting with Rick Moxon and the attorneys. They said, yes, I'm aware. So I know that he knew. That means Ms. Kevich knew about the, the killing order. Yes. I'm convinced of that. And do you think the order came I can't, direct I cannot, from him? I cannot go to court and say I know for a fact he did because I don't know, but I'm convinced he did because he said he was aware of the meeting. Mm -hmm. And again, Scientology attorneys, there's a chain of command in Scientology like any corporation. Someone at the bottom level or even at the mid level is not going to do something unless someone higher up knows about it. It means Ms. Kevich and Rinder knew exactly sure. what what the plan was. Sure. You just, you have to presume that's to be the fact because Scientology is very rigid and very structured and like any corporation, um, a mid-level manager is not going to do something if the person over him doesn't know about it. And so I have to presume that they did know about it. And from the past history that I know about Scientology and what has happened in the past, I believe he didn't know about it. But I, for, you know, and when did that meeting happen? This happened in 1991, December 14, 1991. In Los Angeles on L. Ron Hubbard Way? On L. Ron Hubbard Way. At that time it was Berendo Street, but now it's L. Ron Hubbard Way. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny that I can remember the date, December 14, just before Christmas. And they wanted me to end the life of Bob Warner. And at that time, it was also brought up that sometimes she drove her car with her child. And I didn't know Cynthia kissed her that well. I didn't know she had children. I didn't even know she was married. And uh, Eugene Ingram said, oh, yes, yeah, she has a daughter. And I said, really? And he says, and I said, what happens if a daughter's in the car with her? And he said, well, you'll just have to get rid of the daughter, too. Because the daughter sees, too. You'll have to get rid of the daughter. So they were telling me, in addition to getting rid of Cynthia Kiss, and we had to get rid of the daughter that was in the car. Well, it came to me much later on in court deposition, and Scientology talked about this.